thanks for coming out today uh, when we sent the invitation for the third uh, edition of Role Model Africa. Um, we believe that it was going to be another great interaction with great minds. And we are happy that you came to grace the occasion with your, your distinguished presence because it's you that make this program worth it. And so thank you all for coming out in spite of the rains. I think we all deserve an applause for being here. My name is Dr. William Oche Frempo, and I will be your host for the key discussions. So for anyone who likes radio, our first guest is uh, not new at all. He serves as the news, the director of news programming at CTFM, where he oversees a team of young, budding professionals producing and covering news for Ghanaian radio and online audiences. He graduated, should I say, summa cum laude, with a first class in economics from the University of Ghana, holds an MBA for the Warwick Business School in the UK, an Edward Morrow Fellow of Journalism, and also a Chevening Scholar, one of Ghana's own finest and best kept secrets, Bernard Dino Koku Avle. This side asking the questions, but today, indulge us, uh, let's, let's put you in the hot seat. I'm not too sure if it's a hot seat though. What makes a first class student in economics <laughs> <laughs> settle for a career on radio? It's an interesting question because you're not the first person to have asked it. I think that one of the reasons why media in this part of the world is not doing as well as it should is that we believe that media is almost like an afterthought. You know, the, the space we, we occupy is an important space that shapes the minds of people. I got a call from a guy yesterday who said they were listening to me last week and they were wondering where I had gone the previous week. And his four-year-old son says, where is Bernard? So here I am, four hours a day, shaping the minds of a man, his wife, and his three children in their car. You don't, you don't leave that space to untested people. You don't leave that space to mm. minds which don't have a focus. So I, I will say that the reason why a first-class student would enter media is that at some point the, there was a realization that we need to get people from all kinds of backgrounds into media because the, the airwaves are very critical. So, and I also say that I was lucky that I became aware of my difference when radio in Ghana was growing. I'm sure you know that the, the first private radio station in Ghana started in the mid 90s. So when I got to the university in the year 2000, private radio was just budding. So it was a, a combination of my personal decision and divine providence meeting to, to create an opportunity for me to excel in a field which 10 years before that did not have any particular promise for people like me. So that's my long answer to your, <laughs> to your very short question. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to make this as lively as possible. And so let's appreciate him for, for the, the response. So this is someone who, uh, in spite of the options, the various options that he could have had, uh, especially having graduated as one of the tops in his, his, decided to follow after a passion and also decided to enter a space where he could make a contribution to impact the, the hearts and minds of people. Well, for those of us who are looking at making lasting change and contributing positively to our world, we need to stop for a moment and ask ourselves, what do we really want to spend the rest of our lives doing? When mm. you find that and you engage in that space, you would be celebrated. So Ben, congratulations. Thank you. I think that uh, 20 years down, uh, 15 years down the line, you have had no regrets. So do you have any regrets? <laughs> looking, looking at the, 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 what you had in mind when you were entering this space, um, do you um, think, do, are there any regrets? You think that probably a, a white collar job in this uh, well, air conditioned office in the top floor of the World Bank apart, uh, complex. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> William, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, <laughs> when people ask you if you've had regrets, mm. it, it presupposes that you are getting to an interesting 
phase, so you, are, you have come to an end. I, I am very fulfilled because I believe I am doing what God asked me to do at this time. The, the, the thing of fulfillment is that you can't force it. I always tell my, my, my guys at CTFM that if they weren't paying me for interviewing people, I'll still do it. Mm. Right? If, if I wasn't being given, if I was doing some other job, and this was supposed to be my hobby, I'll still do it. Because I love interviewing, I love conversations. So I've had no regrets. I, it's, it's a great honor to do what I do. It's very humbling, it's very challenging. It's not always easy, but it's a terrific life to wake up every morning, to talk to people, to talk to your friends. It's just incredible. Now, um, people in the media industry, especially those on radio, have have not really kept, uh, should I say, fidelity with their, their mm. uh, original partners. Um, uh, I, I'm sure you understand what I mean. Yes. People have transitioned from various places um, but you you have been at it for at least a, for with city for yes. over over a decade and I think at the last um, um, time there was a celebration they were honored for as one of the longest yeah. seven uh, is there a thing with with city that that you like or, or it's just mm. uh, you think that you were given a rare opportunity and so like Messi who is uh, irrevocably <laughs> tied to Barcelona yeah. that you you, yeah. you 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 just want to stay there mm. well I, I get people asking or, me. or shall we see uh, Bernard Able perhaps uh, in a few years transition uh, either to another radio station or mm. to usually what the courses for those who do English radio is BBC mm. or somewhere mm. else <laughs> it's an interesting thought because you're not a little person who has asked me that question why have I stayed with CTFM since 2004. I think a couple of reasons. Um, I don't see what I do at CTFM as employment. That's the first thing. I don't see it as employment. It's not. A, it's not just a job. Your boss should hear this. <laughs> he will redraw your picture. No, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't understand. see it as a job. Um, I feel I'm part of something special. You know, using your Messi example. So I, for example, Messi. Um, Neymar and Suarez, they could see themselves as employees of Barcelona, or they could see themselves as building something special. I, I am not just an employee, I'm building something. Mm. Um, the history of media in Ghana is still very young, so I want to be part of those who wrote the story. And a rolling stone doesn't really gather a lot of moss. So my idea is to build something which will outlive me. I know I'm not going to be at CTFM forever, but again, I don't want to work at a place and leave the place for the place to just deteriorate. So I approach this as we are, this is a project. We are trying to create a template for, because a lot of young talented people are coming into media now. A lot of people, I mean, you do a radio show now. The media space has opened up phenomenally. So we want to build something that outlives us. So that's why I am, I've stayed true to true, true city. The picture I saw when I started, I don't quite think I finished progress. building that picture. And when I finish, or when we finish, I would know that it's time to move on. So that's why I've, I've stayed with City. All right. Now, what, what, what role, uh, if any, has mentoring played in your, your, the imp your role and the impact that you have made in your, your mm. chosen field of endeavor? You see, I've been very, very lucky throughout my life to have very strong mentors. I have had mentors. You are, you are, are you able to name? Oh yes, I will name a lot of them. I have I, had mentors in, so there are, they are, they are three dimensions of my life. My media work, my spiritual life, and then, if you like, my family. In media, I've had a lot of mentors. I, I interviewed Elijah Abubakar Sadiq Ahmed a couple of weeks ago. He is the main guy at Radio Universe who strengthened and taught us. He's been a very influential person in my life. Himself and Francis Ankara and Samuel Atamensa on the media side have been very, very strong in seeing, I think a great mentor sees your future before you realize that that's your future. And the kinds of tasks they gave me suggested that they saw something in me. I've had mentors on the family side who've helped me structure my personal life very strongly because if you're a media, you're a public figure. Problem is that a lot of people get into the public space without knowing how to 
manage their personal life and it becomes a challenge. So the public exposure destroys them. I've been very lucky to have strong figures who have strengthened my personal and family values. And I believe we share a mentor in the, in the, in the person of your baby. One of the things I say about mentorship is that a lot of people come to me and say they want me to mentor them. I feel that because of how busy people are and because there's so much to do, I've also tried to be mentored by people from afar by reading their books. There are certain authors I read, mm -hmm. and when I meet them, they'll be surprised at how much I know of them. So part of my story is mentorship by readership. Because if, if I mean, the, the kinds of media mentors I've had, I would never get a chance to meet them, okay? But they've written books I have to read. And in reading their stories, I get a sense of understanding of how far they've come. So mentorship has been instrumental in my life, absolutely. All right. Um, now, there's, there's, in the past week or two, there's been a, a very interesting discussion on your, your network, yeah. uh, the morning show, about the role of, of passion and uh, 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 in the in the quest to achieve excellence in a, yeah. an area of, of, of uh, calling. Mm -hmm. Now, would, we, would you say that, um, well, care to share with our, our yeah. audience which yeah. side of the divide you <laughs> are and um, perhaps you take the opportunity to advise them uh, for those who are also entering into diverse spheres, mm -hmm. uh, how they should approach uh, their work. Okay. So what happened was we were reading a newspaper, I think it was a story somebody from CTFM brought about some police recruits who said they just wanted a job. They were not interested in police. This is the way. Uh -huh. They just wanted a job. So my, my, my thought was, <laughs> wow, if people who are in public facing jobs like policing and nursing would say that I don't care so much for policing, but I just want to get a job. I thought I was a bit trou troubling. So we discussed it. Now, the thing about radio and discussions is that to make a point, we present contrasts, but life is not black and white. So on the radio program, Bernard and Sky were on the side of passion, Nanama and Kojo were on the side of survival, or professionalism. But, but life is not like that. What makes uh, Bernard tick? Hmm. <laughs> oh, Lord. What makes me tick? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. I, I, is that, is an evolving answer. In the past, I used to think about the difference I make. And I'll say, oh, if I can make a difference with my talents, it's an opportunity and it, it, it excites me. Now, different things make me tick. My, my, my family, you know, some people say, people ask me, when you go home, how are you? Do you talk as much? And you should, I, it's unfortunate my wife is not here. But my, when I'm home, I'm very observant. I, I look at my, my two sons and my wife, and I get inspired because God has qualified me to have two children. And in seeing family, you, you start appreciating a lot of things about God. You start seeing his greatness. You start seeing your own weakness. You start becoming more patient because this afternoon, my son decided to paint the whole house blue. <laughs> There was this dye in the house, just scattered it throughout the house, and everybody is walking in blue. And that's one of the reasons why my wife can't be here, because she has to take care of that. But my, right now, I am appreciating family more. One of the key drivers of my life is, now that I have kids, I'm thinking of Ghana and Africa, and I'm asking myself, if I'm 70 years old and I'm no longer on the radio, what kind of society will they grow up in? When I retire and I'm living somewhere, will the Ghana I bequeath to them be a Ghana worth living in? So then I'm, I'm motivated by that, and I'm, I'm thinking more about futuristic things. So on the school I, that my, my son goes to, I've joined the PTA, because I want to be involved in the education he gets. Mm. You get what so, so right now, I'm very worried about how my two and a half year old son and my eight or my 10 month old son, in 30 years time, will they say, Daddy, you had a radio show for 15 years. Look at the Ghana you left for me. So those are the things that are making me think. I'm thinking about the future, and I'm trying to make changes that will give them a better future, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Now, um, media is very powerful, um, but then there have been some ins ins instances that uh, certain
people have used media in a very negative way. Yeah. Now, um, looking forward, as you talk about creating the kind of future that we would want, our, we'll be proud that we created for our children to live in. Um, what, what do you think that should be the new uh, things that are, should be put in place, either institutional or, or policy framework? or What could be done to make our, our media landscape more vibrant, more pointed, and more deliberate towards mm. agenda mm. setting? Mm. Thank you for that question. I, I think there are three key poles we should look at. So ownership of media is very important. Mm. The practitioners in media are very important. And then the content creators are very important. There's also government policy and other things, but ownership because we are in a very interesting era where there's a proliferation of media. Like this event, you can serialize 13 episodes of this event and put it on the media. So because of the proliferation, what gets on air has changed. Now you need visionary owners who have a mindset for development. So you can't have somebody who has an itch to just make some extra money or somebody who just has a big church and just wants a radio station to promote his church. We can't have that. We need people who see the medium as a tool to help us leapfrog. So ownership is going to be critical, strategic ownership thinking. Then the practitioners, mm. people like myself, Manasse and Co, mm. we have to up our game. Because no matter the vision of an owner, if the practitioners are mediocre, you're not going to have excellent output. Mm. So there must be a strong focus on training of journalists, of cameramen, of script writers, of musicians. All those people who produce content for media must come from a strong background of excellence, have very strong values, that I'm not going to put something out there just for the sake of it. I'm not just in a job. I am part of creating something special. And then we're going to need very creative content people. So people like musicians, someone who organizes this event must, because it's not just about Super Morning Show, Kokuroko, it's about creating opportunities for engagement. So ownership must be strategic and visionary. Practitioners must be professional. Mm -hmm. And then content creators must be very innovative. And the definition of content is going to change rapidly. So I feel if we understand this future, we will make use of the opportunity that presents before us. But if we blow it, we're going to be here for the next 30 years complaining about the same things. Yeah. Well, friends, it's time to let your light shine as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to give you the opportunity to uh, ask a few um, what questions are on your mind. And so we'll take them in the columns in which you're seated. I am Upper Joseph. Yes, I want to know, Bernard, do you have a book, a autobiography? Right. Simple answer, no, not yet. <laughs> I, I don't have a book yet. All right, another question. I... I share your dream with where the media needs to go, and um, I, I feel that one of the fundamental things is also learning to properly communicate. Leading and asking questions are not necessarily communicating, and I have found that in a lot of times, in, in a lot of situations, people get in trouble because the person interviewing them is leading them to answers that they want, as opposed to properly communicating, understanding what it is that the person wants to put out and allowing them to get their information out. For that reason, I found it very critical for journalists to go to proper communication. It's, it seems like some skip it alongside and we're having, I see a lot of issue in the, in, the, in the ones that come out. I'd like you to communicate on the importance of communication based on your experience and communication being different from talking. Secondly, um, this particular issue that I've raised, how you can help to move journalism away from it so we have proper unbiased dialogues that actually move the nation forward as opposed to a lot of propaganda and talk and just fight, if you can, if you can call it as such. All okay. right. Conveying meaning can be through sign language, through words and, and whatever. Two things I'll say. So there's the what to say and the how. 
I think that, again, we focus on extremes. Some people focus on the art of communicating so much that they don't focus on the what. So he speaks with a nice rhythmic voice. He has a great tone, and yet the content is weak. Right? And then there are people who also focus so much on content, they don't deliver properly. Again, there's need for balance. So I tried, because of where I came from, to focus more on content. Because I felt that the market needed depth more than, sub, more than form. So, so yeah, 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 I don't know if that makes sense. So we, we need people who have the content. Then you work on the art of communicating it. But I agree with you, we need to get people in the media to learn how to speak and write. But also, before that, know what to speak and write about. So we need people from medicine, from economics, from environment, and from wherever, to develop the depth in the content first. And then the art of communicating would follow. I will influence the choice of what they say. So if I'm, inter if I'm recruiting, I will typically recruit somebody who has an interest and a depth in a particular area. And I will teach them the art of communicating that. Than to pick somebody who has the art of communication and say, let me teach them mm. economics. Mm. Do you follow me? So it's a very counterintuitive way of doing things. But I feel, and indeed, it goes to answer the second question. One of the things we are doing, myself and two of my colleagues, we started something called I Journal Africa. We believe that a lot of journalists need to, or journalists need to strengthen the rigorous aspect of analysis, data analysis. So we started something with trained people in data journalism. We've gone to journalism schools and we are doing it like a, a club where every quarter we do a session on data journalism. You must know how to extract, analyze, and use information. Do you follow what I'm saying? So what's going to change that is to get more rigor in the way we do things. Now, I'm not saying that people in journalism are weak. I'm just saying that the question he asked, that why should a first class in economics do journalism, that question betrays a mindset. Because if you go to England, the Jeremy Paxman, mm. He's a first class in philosophy. The guys who control the space, Fariz Zakaria, he has multiple master's degrees. So if you, if you come to Ghana and you say, why does a first class in economics do media? It betrays your mindset about media. So it's a societal problem. You think it's about being a linguist, making people laugh. That's why it's not changing your society. <laughs> if you thought that the media space was the most important space, you put your best people there. Your best people are working in banks. Your best people are in hospitals as doctors. Do you understand me? Your best people won't go into the fields that change lives. The field that changes life, politics, you won't send your best people there. You won't change your best people into media. You send your best people to do things on the side, and then you complain that things are not changing. So we need a mindset shift. If you leave university and go and work in a newspaper, it's not a demotion. Because to qualify to occupy this public space and to write like Manasseh writes for people to think about, it requires a lot of sacrifice and discipline. Your final words to, to our audience? I think Samuel Ajiman, the organizer of this program, is onto something big. And I think we should help him. Well, so, folks, on that note, uh, we'll draw the curtain to the mm -hmm. first segment of the interview sessions with a role model. We have had role model Bernard Avler. Uh, we call him the, the broadcast media avatar.